Our next segment is going to be a little bit of a departure from what we've been doing so far. We've got a little bit of a speed round here. Uh, ben from Dometic is going to come talk to us about Livos Technologies. Um, you know who Ben is. He spoke with us a little bit earlier. And then also in this segment, we're going to have Grant. Where did Grant go? All right. Grant's missing in action. So the good news is we've got Ben here to cover. Um, Grant with uh, Seakeeper grew up in boating, participating in outdoor sports in the Pacific Northwest. This level of the water brought him to his first job in the marine industry as a boat dealership in Seattle. He's been with Seakeeper for over three years. You all know who Seakeeper is, gyro stabilization systems. Um, they've got a, a great display over here in the vendor hall as well. But we're going to start out when Ben gets mic'd up with uh, having him give us a little presentation on Livos Technologies, which is uh, uh, air inlet filtration for uh, machinery spaces. Thank you. Now I got to talk twice as fast. I only got half the time to talk in. <laughs> uh, thanks again. Uh, we're going to, uh, this time around, we're going to talk a little bit about engine room ventilation. Um, Dometic uh, acquired uh, Livos Technologies a few years ago, so it's a, it's a new thing for us, which fits in with HVAC, so it, uh, it's been a good, good add to our product line. In benefits of engine room ventilation, one is clean air. Uh, you have to have an engine room ventilation, of course, you have to have uh, opening, square opening vents coming in to bring air into the engine room and, of course, air out. One for combustion, you know, openings for combustion air, and then another for removing heat. Uh, we also use mist eliminators that are actually put into these vent areas to keep the air dry. So it is a, an, a, a, a filter, you could say, to, as the air comes in, it, it removes the water from the air, so the air that comes into the engine room is dry air coming in. Um, another thing is the fans. Uh, there's, dip, depending on the size of the boat, there's different types of fans to bring air in and bring air out. You have axial fans and you have, which are AC voltage, three-phase big fans for large boats, and then you have little DC fans that are used for intake and exhaust for smaller boats. Uh, controls are a big thing uh, on, on smaller vessels. We have controls that are basically temperature controlled or manually controlled to turn fans up and down, on and off. And then on larger vessels, everything's automatic where you're actually um, using, based on pressure and temperature, you're actually using controls to control fans, to control air in and out so that you maintain a slightly positive pressure in the engine room. And then, then the, set, the fourth thing is dampers. Uh, fire dampers are a big uh, thing for, uh, for vessels to keep in case there's a fire on board. Of course, to cut off oxygen flow to the fire, you want to be able to close the engine room off and keep uh, fire suppression uh, inside the engine room. <clears throat> mist eliminators and grills. Uh, mist eliminators are designed to stop water from entering the engine room. Um, basically, for you, you want to keep, you know, you don't want water in the engine room, especially salt water for, for engine, for, for anything metal, for rust, for uh, electronics, and uh, anything else inside the engine room. This is kind of a, a, an illustration of a, uh, a mist eliminator. It's basically a grill vane type system with the, is, is it shaped like an S that actually has a, a hook, what they call a hook in it. So as the water from the outside passes in, it catches on that hook and it'll either drain different types of drain openings. You can either drain straight down, you can drain into a sump, you can face drain completely out. Just depends on a diff the different types of applications that they have. And these come in different sizes sizes and shapes, uh, different materials, uh, plastic, stainless, uh, just depending on the application and, and, and what, type of, uh, what type of boat that we're, we're, you know, pleasure boat, commercial, military, just different types of applications. Uh, the four different types of mist eliminator drainage options, you have face drain, which again, the water just comes in, slides down, slides right back out the face of the, uh, the eliminator. You have a bottom drain, which actually the water drains down into a, a, a tray down below and then drains out. You have a sump drain and then you have a horizontal type option where it just comes back out the face of the, uh, the drain. Smoke and fire dampers. There are, you know, smoke and fire dampers are important inside of a vessel. Uh, you have different types, different classes. Um, again, one to keep oxygen from coming in to feed a fire and then also to keep the suppressant inside the uh, engine room to remove the fire. 
Uh, different types of uh, smoke dampers, you have A60 rated dampers, which for class vessels, a lot of military uh, commercial applications use these type. They're usually a stainless or a galvanized rectangular or round. Then you have aluminum, standard aluminum smoke type dampers that are covered under any type of class. And then the ways to control these dampers are manual. Uh, the old way is to have a manual switch where you go in and actually pull the lever and close the uh, damper. You have pneumatics and electrics. And usually the electrics are tied into fire suppression systems so that they always supply voltage to these things so to be open and if there's a fire, actually cuts voltage to close the dampers. Fans and blowers. As I said before, we have di different types of, uh, there's different types of fans and blowers in, for the uh, engine ventilation. For larger systems, you see up top there, you got the larger axial fans. And they can go from 12 inch all the way up to 60 inch type fans, just depending on the size of the engine room and the size of the engines that you're working with. Uh, those are, are usually three phase systems and they're controlled by frequency drives to monitor the fan uh, CFM up and down. And then we have smaller fans that are uh, DC controlled for smaller boats that uh, just uh, basically an on and off type system or a, uh, or a temperature controlled. Controls, uh, con controls are, are very important. As I said, there's uh, for smaller systems, it's usually just typically on and off, but on larger boats, where you're trying to maintain a, a pressure inside the engine room, we have pressure and temperature control. So as, as you're at a static situation sitting at dock, usually everything's controlled by temperature. But it, when the engines are on and you're full speed, all the air being drawn into these vessels needs to be controlled. The, the, the pressure inside that engine room needs to be controlled so that when you're actually going in and out of an engine room, you don't have a, you don't, you're not creating a vacuum or you're not over pressurizing that space. In a lot of instances, if you, if you don't have enough intake or you're not running enough fan, you can create such a vacuum in an engine room that you can, you know, you can experience your ears popping or I've been on vessels where you've been up in salons and it's drawing so much air that it doesn't have enough intake, you're actually drawing in, in up in salons, you're actually getting your ears popping in that area. So controls for, for larger systems are very important to control that pressure and again, always have enough air in and out. These are some, some simple, uh, some common configurations. Uh, the first one there on the left is just natural draft, no fans. So the openings are large enough for when the engines go full, full bore, you have enough opening in there, uh, there to draw uh, air in that enough to feed the engines for what they need. Another one is cross, cross flow fan ventilation where you have one fan in and you have one fan out. So you're actually using a cross flow of air across there. And then the third one is the pressure temperature control where you're controlling every fan on how much air it brings in and how much air it brings out to control temperature and pressure inside the engine room. This is a typical uh, installation for a small medium sized boat um, where you have the air coming in the side of the boat. Usually you'll see a vent on the side. Air comes in, goes into a box sometimes a little bit of a torturous path. And then as the air comes in and goes into the engine room, you'll have the mist eliminator that's mounted right here with a fan that's either bringing air in or pushing air back out. And then on some larger vessels, commercial vessels, that, that air intake gets up higher and usually incorporated in with the grill will be the mist eliminator. And then your large axial type fans are mounted in a trunk that comes down into the engine room area. And then in, in larger commercial Coast Guard uh, uh, installations, you'll have multiple fans, multiple in tanks, because you have very large engine rooms and a lot of horsepower on a lot of these boats that are over 300 feet, and multiple controls to maintain pressure and temperature in those areas. So the, the system becomes a lot more complex and in control and uh, temperature and pressure inside that engine room. And that's all I have on that. Oh boy, Ben, thank you very much. It's an interesting, that's an interesting segment that I've been wanting to bring to this seminar for quite some time is uh, bringing the air into the engine room and how do we keep it clean. Do we have any questions for anybody, for Ben in the audience? No questions at all. Everybody knows about getting the salt water out of the air. Excellent. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much, Ben. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Uh, Grant Hagen's here from Seakeeper. He's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the new products that Seakeeper has uh, available for us. They've expanded their range a bit. And instead of stealing his thunder, I'll let him come up and talk to us. Good job. Thanks, Grant. Thank you, Paul. Well, hi, everybody. Good morning. How are you? Or good afternoon now. So by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Seakeeper in this room? That's what I like to see. So we've done our job. All right. Um, well, I've got a short presentation for you here. Um, normally, this is an hour-long presentation. I've tried to cut it down. And me being the long-winded individual I am, I uh, was very uh, eager to do this 15-minute speed round. So I'm going to try and go quickly through some of the basic stuff. And then uh, we'll get to questions at the end. Um, as Paul indicated, we have some very exciting things going on at Seakeeper. Um, our vision at Seakeeper is to bring stabilization to 25-foot boats before 2020. And we're on the track to make that happen right now. So we're going to go ahead and get into a little of the Seakeeper company profile and history, talk about boat roll principles, how stabilization works with the gyroscope. Then we'll get into the Seakeeper technology and uh, move on from there. So real briefly, uh, our production facilities in Moton, Pennsylvania, um, was actually a machine shop that we hired to make the first Seakeeper prototypes. Uh, they were building parts for NASA. Space programs started reeling back as we came to market in 2008. We became their largest customer, then their only customer, because they were slam packed doing Seakeeper to capacity. So we bought the factory, uh, we bought their facility, bought their company, hired their employees, and it became our factory. Our headquarters is in California, Maryland. Um, believe it or not, it's just outside of Hollywood, Maryland. I got a kick out of that being from the West Coast. So, We have four regional sales and service hubs. Um, I'm the sales manager for the Southeast space here in our Fort Lauderdale office. And then we have Dubai, Italy, and Singapore offices as well. Sales and service support staff and spare parts are at each location. We have over, I think that number is now about 170 employees worldwide. Um, we're growing at a pace of about 40, 50% a year as a company globally. So we're adding staff as quickly as we can. We have over 4,200 sea keepers shipped to date. Uh, that number is continuing to expand. Um, we'll talk about our numbers for this year, but we're projecting to ship almost 1,600 units this year. So here's our uh, number of gyros shipped since 2008 when we came to market. Um, 2009, rather, uh, was 114 sea keepers. We only had one model at the time. Since then, we have released six new models, including our first 12-volt DC sea keeper, which we're going to talk about today, for 30 to 40-foot boats. We actually just started shipping this week. So that, uh, our forecast for this year is about 1,510 units. In 2014, the reason the ramp ups uh, increased so greatly there is we introduced a series of five new models. So we had a smaller sea keeper than we've ever had before. It opened up the market opportunity tremendously. Today, we're working with over 400 of the world's major boat brands. Uh, it's easier to name the manufacturers that are not offering Seakeeper on one or more models. Uh, many of these builders have standardized Seakeeper on some of their models. All right, so we aim to achieve 70 to 90% boat roll reduction. And we're achieving as high as 95 and 97% roll reduction right now. So that's truly eliminating boat roll. And the way that we size Seakeeper and the 70 to 95% roll reduction, what we're looking to eliminate is something called resonant boat roll. And that's where the wave period matches the roll period of the vessel. And you end up with an amplification of boat roll three to five times the wave slope. So that's the worst case roll scenario. That's where the boat just seems like it won't ever stop rolling after it's gone through the wave. And so that's what we're combating. The status of stabilization today, um, it, is no longer a it is no longer a luxury, rather. It is now a customer minimum expectation. We get phone calls all the time from customers who are out shopping for a boat, and they say, listen, I, I want a sea keeper. My family wants a sea keeper. We just need a piece of fiberglass to wrap around it. So can you give me the list of boats 30 to 40 feet that offer sea keeper as an option? We also get brokers all the time calling, saying the same thing. They have a customer sitting in front of them. They want to buy this boat, but they won't buy it unless they can put a Seakeeper on it. It also increases resale value, enhances the experience on the water. It keeps boaters boating longer. And uh, it also adds for safety. Our expanding customer base, as I said, we're working with over 400 of the world's major boat builders today. Um, so now the number is at about 490, and it continues to grow every year. 
This is some really exciting uh, information. When we came to market with the SeaKeeper 5 back in to, uh, 2015, it was the first gyro stabilizer ever available for smaller boats. And so in 2015, we shipped 174. We're forecasting 666 units into boats in the under 50 foot category this year with the introduction of our new 12 volt SeaKeeper 3. Just a brief history here of stabilization. Um, of course, all of you in this room know of fin stabilizers. And the SeaKeeper is different in many capacities in the sense that it is a all internal system. So there's nothing outside the boat whatsoever. There's no added drag, there's no reduced fuel economy, and there's no underwater gear to maintain. It's 100% inside the boat attached to the structure of the vessel. So uh, the Seakeeper, you'll, you'll see, and many of you have seen the Seakeeper before, there's a white ball inside the frame. And inside that sphere, we spin a flywheel at speeds up to 557 miles an hour. Um, our fastest Seakeeper runs 10,700 RPMs. And we operate that in a vacuum inside that sphere. So it limits the friction to almost zero. It's like outer space inside that sphere. When you throw a rock in outer space, it'll go forever till it hits something. So we're able to spin that flywheel inside that sphere in a vacuum at a much higher RPM with significantly less power draw. So that's vacuum sealed technology we talked about. So inside that sphere, we have bearings and a motor and other components that create heat. And there's no ambient airflow because we're operating it in a vacuum. So we need to cool it somehow. So we have an innovative cooling system that uses a heat exchanger, seawater, and cycles glycol through all of the components of the Seakeeper to keep things at a cool operating temperature. We have an active control system. So if you come by um, our booth here next door, we have a little mini gyroscope you can play with. And you can feel the torque that a gyroscope will output. But the gyroscope will only output torque if it's able to process or the rolling motion forward and aft. So once it reaches 90 degrees, it no longer stabilizes. So in order to optimize the release of torque and ensure that you have stabilization available in all sea conditions at all times, is we have an active control system that uses a pre-pressurized hydraulic system to dampen and control that movement of the sphere. So it adjusts based on the wave period. There's an accelerometer that measures the wave period and it adjusts so for a two second period, it depressurizes allowing it to process at a faster rate releasing more torque in a shorter period of time. And in a longer wave period, it pressurizes to slow down that release of torque so that it spreads it out over the whole roll of the vessel. When it comes to sizing a sea keeper for a particular vessel, um, as I said, in our marketing, we say 70 to 90% or up to 95% roll reduction. On average today, all of the sea trials, uh, sea trial reports that we collect, they go out to our team on a weekly basis, and we're averaging between 85 and 95% roll reduction on almost every installation today. So the way that we go about a new installation is we look, we have a performance prediction algorithm that allows us to very accurately predict the level of a particular Seakeeper model on someone's specific vessel. So we ask for four uh, specifications off the vessel, the length at waterline, the beam at waterline, the transverse metacentric height or GMT, and then the full load displacement. This algorithm we created back in 2003 when we started developing the Seakeeper and we have refined it over the years, and now we are very, very accurate with our predictions. So those four data points will allow us to create a performance prediction report with this graph. The x-axis is the degrees of uncontrolled roll amplitude, so how much is the boat rolling normally? And then the y-axis is the percentage of that roll that we're going to eliminate. So our graph, we use 80% as a marker for our performance standards. Um, so we have different standards for offshore operations, sport fish, commercial military, as we do for coastal operation. So we put all of that information in the algorithm. We come up with the exact configuration needed to meet our standards. And then when the installation's complete, we have a sea trial app. It's actually now publicly available. You can download it on the, the Apple iTunes store or on the uh, Google Play store. And it's the Seakeeper app. You can use it to measure the boat roll with the Seakeeper disengaged. And then you can engage the Seakeeper and measure the roll and actually come up with a percentage of roll reduction. And so that's the same app that we use internally for all of our sea trial reports that are hosted on our website in the library. And this is what a sea trial report looks like. This graph at the bottom 
is the actual roll angle data over time of the sea keeper off, of course, is the light blue, and then the dark blue is the sea keeper on. So it produces that graph, and then that graph through standard deviation, we're able to understand the exact percentage of roll that was reduced. So we have a fleet now of Seakeeper demo boats that are traveling the country. Um, we have a southeast Seakeeper demo boat that's here in Florida and the Gulf 100% of the time. Um, with our other demo boats right now in California and it's going back to the northeast. So if you have not been on a Seakeeper stabilized boat, maybe I should ask that question. How many of you have experienced Seakeeper? Okay, I also like to see that. For those of you with your hands down, we'll have to change that. So come and see me at the booth and we'll get you out on a demo at some point. The Seakeeper portfolio today, this is our biggest, smallest thing yet, the Seakeeper 3. So as I said, we just started shipping this unit this week. It's 12 volt DC, no generator required, 25% smaller in size, 30% lighter, and less expensive than any Seakeeper we've ever had before. And it's specifically targeted at 30 to 39 foot boat, up to approximately 10 tons. And that's the unit we have installed in our 32 contender that's there in the picture, and also our 35 contender. So this is a video I want to show you guys. This, we bought this 32 contender stock, no structural modifications whatsoever, so that we could retrofit it with the new Seakeeper 3. And we developed a leaning post foundation installation concept um, that really stemmed out of a bunch of guys standing behind the leaning post, pulling on it as they're riding over four foot waves at a high, high speed. But uh, take a look at this video and I'll explain it when we're done. It's a leaning post base with a Seakeeper 3 foundation built into it. And we're now plexusing, that's Plexus MA590. Our, our team wishes they had a pneumatic gun at that point. But uh, we plexus that foundation directly to the deck and then we installed the Seakeeper 3. So what this is saying here, guys, is this is in two days, 16 and a half hours, our team installed that leaning post foundation and the sea keeper. The only thing that was done in advance was the plumbing, the wiring, and the batteries. They all did, they did that at Contender Force just because it was easier with the boat uncapped. But in 16 and a half hours, we were able to install that leaning post foundation and the sea keeper. So this sea keeper three leaning post foundation concept lends itself to a much less expensive installation, much less time in the yard, and we actually have our partner network now setting up refit centers, actual you know, warehouses where they have bays where they'll pull the center consoles in, drop the leaning posts on, drop the sea keeper in, and ship them out the other side. So a lot of these guys are looking to do it in a week or less. Um, so our recreational line today, we have six models, as I said. The Sea Keeper 3 is our smallest unit. And then the Seakeeper 35 is made for boats up to approximately 140 tons um, or 100 and 120 feet plus. In installations larger than that, we install multiple of our Seakeeper 35 or our larger product. And the Seakeeper uh, 3, of course, is for that 30 to 40 foot boat. Each model is for a different size category of boat. So the Seakeeper model name actually represents its stabilization horsepower. Seakeeper 3 produces 3,000 Newton meters per second of angular momentum, which is Newton meters is metric for foot pounds per seconds over time. So it's just how much torque it has to release total over time. We did just release an HD product line. Um, this is specifically aimed at the commercial, military, and high hour heavy use sport fish applications. The guys running the tournament circuits putting more than 500 hours a year on their sea keeper. We'll talk about this model lineup. And basically what we did in short is we detuned our current product line by 20% and it increased the bearing lifespan by 400%. 
So in applications where they're in very rough seas, the North Sea commercial boats operating out there, we're installing the HD product line in order to achieve that higher lifespan and durability. Um, real quick plug here for the Seakeeper 6. This starts shipping uh, July 1st, and the Seakeeper 6 is going to replace the Seakeeper 5 today. It's 20% more powerful, same envelope, same footprint, same everything. We're just increasing this, the uh, horsepower of the unit in order to segment our product line a little bit better. But to give you an idea, that's to scale. That was our M7000, which was our very first Seakeeper we started shipping in 08. The Seakeeper 6 is just as powerful on its total anti-rolling torque, and it's smaller in size, lighter in weight, and significantly less expensive, about half the price of what that 7000 was back then. We have a new touch screen that's gonna be coming out with a three. By the end of the year, it'll be integrated to all the models. It's NEMA 2000 capable. You can uh, display all your Seakeeper information right up on the MFDs, and it'll be a nice touch screen LED display. And in closing, a um, couple points is that Seakeeper, we have a two-year, 2,000-hour warranty on our standard product line. And then on our HD product line, we have a four-year, 4,000-hour warranty. We also have a 24-7 hotline uh, for service. If it's business hours in the United States, our team here answers the phones. And if it's business hours in the UK, our team there answers the phones. So customers anywhere in the world can get Seakeeper support 24-7, 365. They can also call my cell phone. I'm available 24-7-365. Our partner network now is expanding rapidly. We're at over 130 partners globally. Um, they're installation and service centers or one or the other. Um, we have some designators now so we can add more service partners to service the units that are in the field. But there's an interactive map on our website. If any of you are ever looking for information on one of those service centers, you can go to that map and identify exactly where they're at. And that's all I had. Is there any questions? Great, thank you. Questions? <laughs> Sandy? Can, can you uh, comment on what the um, requirements are for attaching this to a vessel? We're looking at putting a, as an example, we're looking at putting a number nine in a boat that, that's 54 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, the unit weighs 1,200 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. What are the requirements for attaching it to the boat? So the Seakeeper needs to be integrated into the whole structure somehow. It needs to be able to transfer the loads to the whole structure. So the, uh, the Seakeeper can be installed in whole, and that's how it's traditionally been installed, just tie into the stringer system of the boat. Um, or in the smaller Seakeeper, like we saw in the video there, it can be installed at deck level directly to the deck if it meets the requirements. So on the fifth page of all of our installation drawings, in the top left-hand corner, there's loads in the X, Y, and Z axes. It's our max loads that the Seakeeper is going to output. Um, so those, that information can be uh, considered while you're building the structure. And as far as placement in the boat, it can literally be anywhere in the boat, port, starboard, forward, aft, high, low. It doesn't make any difference on the performance. Excellent. We had another question over here in the front, right next to you, Dunnett. This is general. Uh, this new 12-volt unit, what does it draw? So the power draw is 900 watts at spool up. And then once it's spooled up after about 40 minutes, it drops off to a nominal draw of 450 watts. So about 35, 40 amps nominal and 80 amps or so max. Cost? 27,000 for the unit. And then of course, installations depending. Great. We had yes. another question. Well, in Steve. What's the service interval hours wise and what does it entail and what is cost like on the service interval? Sure. Um, we just come out with some standardized uh, kind of MSDS like they do for the auto industry, um, where it's standardized number of hours for particular jobs. Um, I haven't done the math on what a full service costs, but the interval is two years, 2,000 hours. Um, now, there is a zinc in the heat exchanger of all of our models from the Seakeeper 5 on up. So that needs to be checked on a routine basis and changed like any other zinc on the boat. Depends on the marina you're in, how quickly that's going to wear. Two years, 2,000 hours, there's three things that occur at that service, and that's the only service. Change the glycol, change the hydraulic fluid, and then change the bushings and the brake arms. They're at the pivot points, and they're basically a plastic bushing. So that can all be performed by that partner network. The average cost that I've heard is you know, anywhere from $1,000 to $1,700 um, for that service at two years. Down the middle, Shay's coming around to you. Oh, I'm sorry, in the back, Mark. 
Um, on your HD uh, product, can you target uh, heavy duty commercial boats? I'm talking about like uh, from your crab boats to a ferry boat system. And are you just scheduled just for monohulls and that's it? Or do you look at cat hulls or catamaran hulls or? Uh, yeah. And where do you buy your stock? <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, there's a long line forming. We're currently still a privately held company, but uh, I'll let you guys know when the IPO is coming out. Um, so as far as the commercial world, it, it, historically, it's been about 5% of our business. Um, so we haven't, you know, we want to get more into the commercial military world. We have many, many installations on everything from 58-foot commercial salmon saners up in Alaska. Um, I've been up there a couple times working with those guys. We actually have an early HD prototype on one of those boats up there. It's how we developed this program. Um, we have Sea Keeper on the Hong Kong police patrol boat. Um, and then on one of our most recent exciting projects is Clean Gulf Associates out in uh, Port Fouchon, Louisiana. They're an oil skimmer vessel, and they contract all the oil companies for things like Deepwater Horizon. They have Sea Keeper on all of their 95-foot oil skimmers. Um, and then uh, you asked about, I think, uh, did I answer your cat, question? Cat versus mono. Cat versus uh, mono hole, yes. Well, on the commercial side of the business, how far are you going to go on the hour usage? Uh, what, what's your duty cycle on what you want to put them on? I mean, a boat that puts 1,500 hours, 4,000 hours, 6,000 hours, where are you limiting your, your product to? Well, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people that have, are, well, I'm looking to repower boats. Yep. And they're looking to uh, put Seakeeper in it, and there's some a lot of f uh, ferry vessels and so forth in the island. So I just, they're asking about it, and sure. I, that's why I'm asking you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, the, um, so real quick, I'll address the cat versus monohull. Um, our wheelhouse is monohull vessels. That performance prediction algorithm I showed you, that's based on a monohull design. We don't have a prediction algorithm for catamarans. That being said, we have one installation in the field on a Calcutta 390 that's been out operating for a number of years. Unfortunately, it was shrunk wrap and put on a freighter to the Prince of Qatar before we were able to get on the boat. So we don't have any sea trial data or any evidence of us actually being on the boat where we could say, yes, this is good, or no, this is not to our standards. That being said, there's been a lot of interest, um, specifically from Freeman, regarding adding Seakeeper to a catamaran vessel. So Freeman is actually currently involved in their first installation of the Seakeeper 5 and their 42, and we're going to use it as a case study to understand how the Seakeeper performs on a catamaran vessel. Um, now, as far as duty cycle on the Seakeeper HD series, we just started shipping the Seakeeper HD series uh, this year. So we have a number of installations now that are out in the field that are operating. Um, of course, not, none of them have hit you know, 10, 15,000 hours yet. Um, but we do have early models, the Seakeeper Model 21,000, which was a recreational product line with 20,000 hours on it and still counting. No major rebuild. So our engineered bearing life is 10 to 15,000 hours. We came out with the HD series with four times the lifespan for a 20% detune, specifically because of these high hour heavy use applications. So I would say that our, our duty cycle for that unit, we're still aiming to reach 15 to 20,000 hours um, with the HD product line. It might be more. Um, and of course, it's a mechanical piece of equipment. It could be less. Um, but at the end of the day, time, time will tell. We've done a lot of testing on it, and we're looking forward to seeing what the infield data tells us. Thank you. Gentleman with a light blue shirt. Yeah, could you uh, go back to that? That's, well, you don't have to go back to the slide, but explaining the fundamental engineering, and I guess of every system, you've got the flywheel spinning, mm -hmm. and that, you said, produces um, uh, counter torque or whatever to stop the roll up to 90 degrees, and then you have this active system, and what would happen if you just had a gyro spinning in there um, and not that? Yeah, not yep. that part. Oh, thank you for your question, I understand. Um, so the little mini gyroscope that I mentioned that I have at the booth here in the room next door is literally just a flywheel spinning at a high rate of speed in a cage, and it has gimbals port and starboard. So I, you can hold on to it, and you can feel that torque. So a gyroscope's naturally going to release that torque, and it's going to fight the, the, the roll, taking it off its plane of spin. So it's the same concept that a motorcycle uh, uses when it, the faster you go on a motorcycle or a bicycle, the more stable it becomes. Five miles an hour, it's going to tip over 100. It's going to be very stable. So we spin this, this flywheel, and we mount it to the boat port and starboard. 
But if you have, you only have so much stroke. You have 180 degrees of stroke until it won't create torque anymore. So what we do is we optimize that release of torque by controlling the procession so that in a longer wave period, it's not gonna reach its mechanical stop. We're gonna slow down that movement. You'll get less torque release, so you may have a little bit less uh, roll reduction percentage, but you're never going to lose stability during that roll, which is more important. So we have same boat in a two foot, sec uh, two foot or excuse me, two second wave period, might be getting 95% roll reduction, and in a 10 second wave period, it might be getting 70% roll reduction. So that's kind of how that works. Awesome. Did we have one more question? We have time for one more. No more? Grant, that was awesome. Okay. Thank you very, very Thank much. You, Paul. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you all.